Okay, I'm recording now. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so another um, expectation, I guess, is we think we're going to grow strawberries in our, our garden, and the kids are going to go out there and pick them, and they're going to be these perfect blemish-free strawberries. Sometimes that occurs, but oftentimes we don't think about the reality there of having to actually maintain that uh, bed of strawberries, because weeds can be a major issue in our strawberry crops. The one thing I would say though is when you do start thinking about growing fruit crops is just to not be intimidated because we all love fruit, right? Um, and it can be done. You just have to kind of move through the steps to, to get you where you, you want to be. So like I said, this was uh, presented to agents and specialists across the state. And so we divided this into three sections and the first being reality and expectations. When you think about growing fruit, what is that reality? So the big thing is that it just takes time, uh, money, no matter what size uh, a crop that you're looking at, whether you're going to do three or four trees or you're going to do a few strawberries in a raised bed, you're going to have two or three blueberry bushes, you know, all of that's going to re require a little investment on your part. So we love this little cartoon as extension agents, and we put this little scenario up there. So, you know, a client enters our office and says, I got five acres and I want to grow fruit. So you can see the picture there, the extension agent, because we've got somebody that comes in, they have this great idea and they want to do this and this and this. And again, right there is the grapes making the wine, you know, that's, that's where I'm at. And, you know, I have to be really realistic with myself because I know I don't have the time um, or the space to, to be able to do that. And then you have the swiveling peach there. And Bill, I know you sent me an email early about peaches and um, I, I reserved answering that till tonight um, because you're gonna find out that peaches are not the easiest crop to grow in East Tennessee. But um, anyway, you know, when you, when you come in and are looking for advice, trying to find resources to get growing with fruit, you know, it can be pretty nerve wracking, right? Because you, you've got these great ideas, what's the next step? So some of the questions that you may have is how much time is this going to take and what is the real time investment? And I put some of these slides in here because, you know, you, you, you've got all these questions and you're thinking, you know, you're overzealous and you really want to get into it, but we don't consider that when it starts, you know, this time of year or we move into summer in a typical year, maybe a little different this year, but, you know, we'd rather be anywhere but in the backyard taking care of our fruit crops. So I kind of finished up with this slide. I'd, I'd rather be anywhere but here, or sometimes job responsibilities or family responsibilities, you know, negate the fact that we need to be taking care of fruit crop because there is a pretty substantial investment of time um, with, with growing fruit. So this is kind of where we feel as extension agents, or you, if you're a master gardener working with clientele, to be pretty honest and up, up front um, because any, anybody that wants to go into fruit production needs to know what they're, what they're kind of up against. So again, it's just a matter of providing those realistic expectations, giving you a roadmap, and, and hopefully tonight that's going to start, as, as we say, wetting your whiskers, you know, get you kind of pondering about, you know, what, what you need to do next, if this is really a good idea for you to get into. So again, one of the issues that we often encounter is folks uh, typically don't, or folks typically spend more time on growing their own fruit than they actually do purchasing at a farmer's market or a grocery store. And a lot of folks don't realize that because of the amount of spray involved. And we're gonna get into that in a, in a lot more detail here in a few minutes, but, um, especially if, if a consumer says they're not going to spray. And I put this in here because this happens all the time. We'll have folks come in in July with, or August with issues that needed to be taken care of in January, February, or March. And they've never gotten on a good uh, spray control program. And by that point, it's too late to be controlling some of those issues. And that just is another instance of when it's very critical to keep that journal that I'm always talking about to know what pest, you know, be it disease or insects or weeds uh, that you're having that pressure with because often if they're an issue one year, then they're going to be prevalent from year to year. 
Um, this happens from time, time to time. We will get calls or have folks come in that uh, want to grow fruit crops that don't even live in, in, in the area. Uh, that they want to they plant a blueberry orchard because it's uh, the least amount of time investment, but you still have to main fruit so we we just put that in there in there to just make you aware that you can't just plant a crop leave it and think it's going to be okay you know the same in three or four months so again here's one of, one of those pictures that we often envision you know we we look at this bunch of grapes and we think wow that's awesome that's incredible I want to do that but here in Northeast Tennessee and as we're going to talk about a little bit later you're going to see grapes can have a uh, some pretty serious disease, fungal organisms uh, that attach themselves to the leaves and to the to the berry here and can cause some pretty significant uh, reduction in yield. Uh, so oftentimes this is this is what um, a crop of our backyard grapes are going to look like, especially if we're not uh, you know again adhering to some of those fruit tree or fruit spray schedules. And of course the beloved peach um, and we kind of candidly say enough with peaches already, let's grow some blueberries and apples because this is one crop that um, is, is very hard to achieve success with. And I don't, I don't think Philip Ottinger would mind me throwing this out there, but he, he's a peach uh, fruit grower down in um, South Green area. He straddles along the, the mountainside there, so he's got a perfect location for all kinds of fruit trees, but you know, peach, really cause him significant trouble, which they're the best peaches you'll ever eat. But now he will tell you it's a 13 month um, a year job to grow a crop of peaches and honey crisp apples. So um, that's why you pay a little bit more for those at the store because again of the, the time and the inputs uh, that go into producing those crops. And even from a homeowner vantage point, it's gonna be really hard to, uh, to control some of those fungal organisms because Peaches really are a, a tropical plant um, by nature. And you know, you've, you've heard me speak uh, in like soil, soil, uh, soils class when I talk about the pH always reverting to its, its native pH over time. Um, so, you know, as a tropical plant, it still thinks it, you know, it still wants to be growing in that tropical environment. So that's one reason that they don't do quite as well. Not to say you can't grow them, just understanding that it's gonna be a little bit tougher um, than any of the other fruit crops that we talk about. And again, this is um, just a slide looking in, in, you know, somewhere along the central coast, I think, or maybe this is in Oregon or Washington. Anyway, it's on the west coast, but you know, out there they can grow uh, pretty substantially with an organic, you know, organic crops. You know, there's even organic wine coming out of that uh, west coast area. Uh, but again, we're not on the west coast, we're in northeast Tennessee and that we, we are just inundated with fungal um, organisms, you know, those spores that get spread by the wind and water. So always going to be an issue for us, unfortunately, here in east Tennessee. So here's a slide you're probably going to see a couple of times tonight because I think it's real critical to consider this when you start thinking about growing fruit. So. If you're just getting started with fruit, uh, you, you know, want something low investment that takes up less space, then obviously strawberries and blueberries and cane berries are going to be your option. And when we speak about blueberries, and again, we'll get into this in a little bit more detail later, but uh, the rabbit eye are going to be a little bit better investment because they're um, more acclimated to this area. Uh, then we consider some grapes, especially muscadines, uh, to be a middle of the road crop along with high bush blueberries and again some of the cane berries. Uh, muscadines can be a little bit finicky depending on where they're grown um, but they're they're pretty easy if you can get them established and really the only major issue is is the weather and of course that's something we can never truly predict if it gets too cold then oftentimes um, it can it can stunt them back pretty significantly. Some of those challenging um, and, and time consuming, requiring a little bit higher skill set to grow are gonna be those apples, pears, table grapes, uh, wine grapes, and of course, peaches. And then you'll notice there in those last two columns, probably not worth it, are gonna be some of the wine grapes, uh, more specifically the Vitis vinifera, or those French grapes that if you're a wine drinker, uh, you, you're pretty, um, pretty fond of, like the, the Cabernets and the Zinfandels and the Chardonnays. 
uh, tart cherry, sweet cherries, you want to leave those to the uh, peninsula in, in Michigan. That's where they're pretty prolific. Um, apricots, olives, figs. Uh, we do, we can grow some figs here, but it, it's, it's got to be a specific cultivar. Plums, all of those are going to, again, they're tropical in nature, so they're going to be really hard to take hold here. So a couple of the documents that you're going to get tonight after class are these three flowcharts. So kind of depending on where you are in fruit production, uh, these are PDFs and they actually have live links embedded in them. So it'll take you directly to some of our new fruit publications um, and spray schedules and things that'll help you in, in regard to, to fruit production. So you'll, you'll be getting this a little bit later tonight. Uh, the second thing we want to think about is if, if we are starting from scratch is to think about that USDA hard, hardiness zone because it is going to be a little bit more critical for fruit than it is vegetable crops. So we kind of need to know where we fall on the map. And anyone that has taken my classes before knows that I say um, quite regularly that Greene County is, could pretty much be divided into four counties because of our microclimates. Of course, within the hardiness zone, we're going to fall into 7A, but depending on where you are in the county, or we've got some here that are, are in other counties, you really need to kind of consider your, your location. Um, there's going to be a lot of other things that are, are going to influence um, the way your crops are going to produce, just depending on, on where you are. The other thing to be cognizant of is that disease triangle, which we put this in a then model here, but you know, uh, we got to think about environment, host, and pathogen. We need all three of these to create a disease. And you'll notice there under environment, weather conditions uh, conducive to disease. And that's going to be really critical for this area because oftentimes we think um, when we, we say uh, a, fungal, a fungal disease is spread by wet weather, and we automatically assume that's rainfall, but that's not always the case. It can be dew, it can be a heavy fog, especially, you know, when we get into late summer, August, September, some of those fogs can be really heavy and linger in the morning. That sun's not burning them off, so that's just a perfect breeding ground uh, for some of those fungal organisms. And of course, a host, and you're going to see later on in the presentation how, what some of those relationships are with other species uh, that can cause significant damage to some of our fruit crops. So this is a, a busy slide, but it, it just, it, it's packed full of information. But again, it's, it's kind of talking about some of the things we're, you know, the five S's that we'll talk about a little bit more in detail, but just briefly, uh, site selection, soil pH, all those things are going to be really critical. Uh, you know, we need to think about those microclimates on, on a hill just as much as we need to think about a microclimate uh, within the area where we live, in the county that we live or whatever. Uh, pH, of course, is going to be a big issue for blueberry production. We have so many folks that plant blueberries this time of year that have never amended that soil and they're doomed to fail before they've even gotten started. So they, they might get a year or two in, but that plant typically is just going to lock up and not do anything unless that soil pH is where it needs to be. That's why with blueberries, we say take a year to get that crop uh, or to get that ground where it needs to be before you plant the first plant. Uh, remember too that when we talk about that microclimate, it's it's also heat and humidity. It's not just about being cold when we talk about site selection. Uh, that's one of the, the big issues there. And then also with water is to make sure if we've got a crop that we're putting out, if, if we might need uh, irrigation later in the season. So here's just a little snippet on stone, poem, or drooplet. So let's get interactive for a minute. Who knows what we're looking at on the screen right now? Is that a stone, a poem, or a droplet? I'm going to get y'all away. Stone. 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 Yeah, yeah, stone. Right, exactly. So again, um, anything that, any of these are going to have stones, and they're very closely related to the prunus genus, uh, which is the cherry and even some of the cherry laurels and things like that, their seeds are going to be really big and, and hard. And again, the stone fruits, all of these are going to be native um, to those tropical areas. Again, that's why it's so hard to grow those here. Hey, everybody, make sure you mute your um, microphones. 
And when you're outside, social mm -hmm. distancing applies to animals too. No playing with other people. Okay. Okay, there we go. All right, so up next, so what does that make these? Makes them a poem, right? And that's apples and pears that are going to fall into that. And then a druplet, you can see that up in the corner there. That's the individual little berries that make up the big berry of a blackberry or a raspberry. So some of that terminology um, is good to know, especially when you're starting to buy cultivars or you're working uh, with other, you know, clientele if you're a master gardener. You know, it's just good to know what some of that terminology is. So here's a question. Are cultivars that important? Can you purchase these at Lowe's or, or Home Depot or Walmart and still be successful? Yes, you can, but you need to really research those um, cultivars. You need to really know what you're purchasing. Uh, really get intimate with that, that tag or that label if you're pur purchasing from one of those uh, box stores. Um, oftentimes, as far as fruit, we will order from outside sources and have um, the root stock come in. We've just ordered caneberries and apples and strawberries, and most of that's actually going to be coming from the Midwest or, or from, the, from the West Coast. Um, just to kind of make sure that we are definitely getting what, what we need, um, this is, this is uh, specific for field trials that we're doing. But um, cultivars are going to be very critical because that's where your disease resistance, your climate, and all of those crucial components are going to come into play. So again, it's kind of like that pH not being just right for blueberry production. If we don't get the cultivars right, you know, right out of the gate, then that's going to cause us problems. So, so just be real careful with that. So chilling hours. Oftentimes we'll speak about chilling hours and what the heck is that? So just a brief synopsis because we'll cover that in another session but you know are chilling hours necessary why is that so critical and which crops do we even need to consider chilling hours for so chilling out you know before a plant can break dormancy they got to accumulate a specific number of hours with those temperatures between 32 degrees fahrenheit and 45 degrees fahrenheit um, if those chilling hours are too low then that that plant is going to bloom early and then of course frost damage we all know how finicky mother nature is in these parts so you know that can cause a loss for peaches you know this time of year we're always well, not this time but even a couple of weeks ago thinking about you know frost injury you always hear us refer again to peaches um, because peaches are going to be one of the most critical if your chilling hours are too high then that plant's going to break dormancy too late in the season season and then it's going to cause um, um, the leaf the leaves are going to leaf out poorly and you're not going to be able to get a good yield from that either so that's why it's so critical to know what our chilling hours are and for tennessee we usually like to be in the range of a thousand to fourteen hundred for this area twelve hundred is a good uh, pretty good target uh, when we think about fruit production we we have again different needs go back to that first slide it's it's not a one size fits all um, some of you may consider wildlife, some of you may, it may not be a big deal. Some may be growing fruit specifically as pollinator crops or just edibles in the landscape. Uh, some of you may actually be wanting to preserve the harvest and, you know, with birds, that's going to be really tough to do when, when we have um, any kind of berry because all of these species are going to love fruit just as much as, as we do. So uh, you got to remember too that poor pollination can often be a a problem with fruit set and bees are going to be less active um, when it's cool and cloudy out too and sometimes that can be an issue. How many plants do you need? This is always a question you know that that we get and again that answer is just going to be completely dependent on you and and the space. Uh, cultivar is going to dictate that a lot of times um, but the big question is how many do you want to take care of? Uh, you've, you've got to remember some of those time constraints and the plant populations. Again, those are going to come into play when, when you're planting um, a fruit orchard. Uh, we also get the question often about bare root versus uh, container. Is one better than the other? And um, it, again, that's a personal preference. I think you can be successful with both. Uh, but bare root, we tend to have a little bit better success with I think in Northeast Tennessee it just gives us a little bit more of a 
of an advantage, a little bit step ahead, I think, versus the container. But that's just a matter of personal preference. We've seen both be very successful. But just some things to leave you with on this section is just don't assume, you know, uh, don't assume that you can um, grow that favorite grocery store or familiar apple. You know, up in Nova Scotia last year, come across an orchard, no, it wasn't in Nova Scotia, it was in Lake Champlain. And I, oh man, it was the best apple ever. And I never even heard of it. I can't remember the name of it now because it was kind of pointless. I knew we'd never be able to grow it here anyway. I actually sent Dr. Lockwood a text with that variety and I got back a bunch of laughing, smiley faces. So I just let it go. <laughs> um, but don't assume either that no spray translates to no spray in the Southeast, because again, that goes back to those weather conditions. We are in a really um, temperate area. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it in August and September, but uh, we can be very temperate with those heavy fogs, dews, uh, early spring rain. So that's, that's always going to cause an issue with those fungal organisms again. Uh, don't assume that all chemicals are bad. Oftentimes in growing fruit, we're going to need those chemicals to be successful, be it organic or conventional. Uh, don't assume that fertilizer is always good. Uh, fertilizer can actually um, be bad for some of our crops. And I'm going to say this now, so I don't want to forget this when I get to blueberries. And some of you have heard me say it, but blueberries don't have root hairs, which means that they don't have that little extra protection like a lot of our other crops do. So it's really easy to burn blueberry roots. That's why we're very cautious. We don't want you putting fertilizer in the furrow when you plant, um, any kind of manure or heavy compost that those roots can touch because it can burn them and stunt them back. Don't assume that um, garden center personnel always know um, the sources or good sources for things or that they know their stuff. This is a Carol Reese quote. This is not a Melody quote. Um, I think this is more of an issue probably in West Tennessee, but, um, but don't assume that. Always do your own research and, and know what you're getting before you purchase. Uh, don't assume manure is a good idea. If it's composted manure, most of the time that's going to be a, a wise investment, but sometimes it can be too hot. And if we get too hot on nitrogen, of course, that's going to cause that really prevalent foliage leaf out. It's going to be a a beautiful leafy tree or you know uh, pretty blueberries on the I mean leaves on the blueberries or whatever but it's going to encourage that vegetative state rather than fruit production. Don't assume that a scheduled watering or irrigation is a good idea because believe it or not over overwatered plants rarely recover. Um, plants can pretty well withstand a droughty <coughs> time period but if you keep watering and watering and watering, especially newly planted fruit like blueberries, or, they don't like to be standing in water. They gotta have good drainage. And oftentimes that's gonna stunt those uh, fruit crops back. And it's gonna be different for every crop. Uh, so again, you're gonna get a um, flow chart here for starting, scratch, or starting from scratch for home fruit. And again, you're gonna see those live links for our new publications. And you're gonna see some space requirements there because it's gonna differ. And even within those subcategories, it's gonna be a little bit different depending on the, the species. If you're like for blueberries, if you're growing rabbit eye versus high bush, uh, there's gonna be a little bit of difference there too. All right, the, the last little segment in this session we're gonna talk about are those um, established plantings. And again, we're gonna go back and look at that really pretty orchard. You know, uh, maybe some of you have recently moved into the area or um, you bought a piece of ground and it's got existing crops on site. You know, maybe, maybe you even started your own fruit production system years ago and kind of let it go because life got in the way. So um, now instead of looking not like that, it looks more like this. And we see this a lot, right? Driving down the road, I see this quite frequently. Or maybe I'm just more in tune, you know, look and seeing that kind of thing. Maybe I'm just more aware, but <clears throat> to kind of move along in this segment, I'm just going to throw some questions that we often receive in the extension office. So one that we get pretty frequently is I had a crop of apples last year, but not this year. What the heck, you know, is going on? So there's many factors that are going to affect this phenomenon. Uh, again, climate, we always go back to that. Mild winters actually can be very brutal 
how many of you would have ever guessed that? I'm gonna say that again. Mild winters can be more brutal than heavy winters. Uh, we can often have pollination problems, and again, that can inadvertently be tied back to climate as well. Uh, we could have cold weather or a, a frost or God forbid even a freeze during bloom time. Um, the need for cross-pollination among those different varieties, that might be an issue. Um, we might just have one tree instead of two or, you know, we might not have the proper cross-pollination in place. And um, we could just have excessive fruit set from the, from the year before. Another one that we get is why did my trees not set fruit? And again, um, what are we gonna, what's that number one that we always go back to? Um, Mother Nature again, because frost and freeze damage uh, during bloom set is gonna cause us to suffer a pretty significant reduction in yield. And you know, the, probably the only difference here would be uh, grapes. Grapes have a tertiary bud, so they can withstand frost injury a little bit better than some of our other fruit crops, but with each, you know, when we lose that primary bud and then that secondary bud, we're also losing fruit yield, right? So we still want to be able to maintain the viability of that first fruit bud set because that's where we're going to get the most fruit. Uh, another reason your tree, uh, trees may not set fruit is just because of poor pollination, um, lack of pollinators. Um, for, it depends on the philosophy of the homeowner. Uh, for some, that's going to be the first thing that comes to mind. For others, it's not even going to be um, a, a reality. So um, maybe two, not everybody thinks again about that cross-pollination factor that you can actually increase yield by doing that. Sometimes trees won't set fruit because they're just too over vigorous. Again, um, almost loving our plants to death. You know, we're, we're fertilizing maybe too excessively. Again, with that nitrogen fertilized, that's just going to push that vegetative growth instead of, of bloom material. So um, some of the things you want to kind of question is, you know, is my rootstock involved? Did I not, again, start with the right cultivar? Is my soil fertility off? That could be an issue. Uh, lack of pruning, that is, that is usually our number one reason um, because if we're not maintaining um, those fruit trees, they're not gonna produce for us. They're gonna get real mean and ugly and they'll just pretty much shut down on us. Uh, so my fruit set, but then they, they all fell off. So again, it's kind of quirky. So what, what is causing this? Why is it disappearing or what's going on there? Well, wildlife could be an issue, especially if you're along the mountains, you know, down on the North Carolina line. Um, bears can even be an issue there. We've seen a lot of those, I'm not sure what you call that, bear scrapes, bear rubs, whatever, um, where they've just been climbing and eating the, eating the trees or eating the apples out the top of the tree. So uh, oftentimes too, if you're, if your, loot, uh, if your fruit's falling off, commercial growers will actually use carbaryl, which is an insecticide, which is seven. So if anybody's using seven, uh, commercial orchards will use that to thin fruit. Uh, so that could be another, I don't know if any of you are actually doing that, but if you also prune in late summer, early to, well, mid to late summer, if you're, if you're actively if you're pruning when that tree is actively growing, especially young vigorous leaves, it can also cause your fruit to fall off. And then oftentimes we'll have insects, mite, and diseases that are going to put pressure on the tree that we might not necessarily see. Oftentimes they're going to be embedded in the fruit. Um, we won't see that until we start having that fruit drop. But if you have a lot of that occurring, then you need to investigate, actually cut open that fruit and see if there's anything going on there. Uh, some are just going to have a heavy fruit load and it's kind of a defense mechanism. They're going to shed some of that fruit. So if you have Macintosh, Red Delicious, uh, stamens, those trees are going to shed fruit naturally just because that's, that's what they're bred to do. Sometimes you'll have fertility issues. You could have a high boron issue. We've seen that happen in Greene County. Uh, we could have magnesium issues that are too low. Um, that could be something just as simple as amending the soil that will help correct that problem. And again, poor pollination can always be an issue. Another question is how do I prune? We, we have these 
um, pruning workshops. I think pretty much every county in Northeast Tennessee is hosting these. Uh, Dr. Lockwood usually comes up and, do, and does these for us. Uh, but there's, there's some different pruning mechanisms, but the thing to remember is that you don't prune a peach tree the way you prune an apple tree. That's probably the biggest takeaway. And that's something when we get into the crop specific, which don't worry, that's not going to be tonight, but uh, when we get into some of these specific crops, we'll go into far more detail on some of these pruning concepts. But renovating strawberries, uh, some people just can't imagine mowing over those strawberries or making these you can see kind of from this um, little cartoon how that's pretty heavy pruning. You know, I remember the first time that Dr. Lockwood came up here and did a pruning demo for me 20 years ago, and he pretty much cut the whole tree down. And I mean, it was like, what is he doing? I mean, like, what did this grower ever do to him? You know, it was, it was just crazy to me, but I didn't have a lot of experience with fruit. But actually, to get the best fruit yield, you need to be pruning pretty heavily. Just remember, um, trees are gonna be a lot like us. They need some tender loving care. Otherwise, this is what's gonna happen. And this has had to happen more than once. Folks that have moved into the area and um, inherited an apple orchard, um, they get stuck just starting from ground zero. Another situation is folks wanting to grow grapes, but there are so many types of grapes out there. Uh, this, this is one of those crop specific classes that takes a little bit longer than others because there's so many different um, species and varieties. You know, what do you want to grow it for? You just want to grow uh, for jams and jellies, or you want to grow muscadines? Do you want to grow wine grapes? Um, and depending on what you're wanting to do, there's different trellising systems in place for each one of those. And then of course, depending what, on what trellis system you use, uh, where your site selection is, that's going to kind of determine how you how you prune these because again it's going to be kind of varietal specific um, and then again peaches sorry bill why did my peaches bloom so early um, well because again they're tropical and they're just going to be the first thing to leaf out along with plums and and cherries if we're growing those for fruit so one of the biggest disappointments, because a peach is one of my favorite fruits, is that there's a, just a short window for those too, if we do make it to harvest. And usually we just don't have a really good yield because mother nature kind of dictates that for us. So peaches can be just a little bit confused in Northeast Tennessee. And then again, you're gonna receive this and that kind of guides you through some different steps as to what you need to do for fruit production. So with that one, I'm gonna end that one. Are we still awake out there? Yep. I can only yes, see like, yes. yes, we are. Yes, we're awake. Right. Cool. So yeah. I wasn't sure. I'm like, am I talking to myself? Hello, people. No. Okay, let me see. So that was just a really brief overview of what's going on with fruit production and some of the things we encounter. Um, on a regular basis here in the extension office. So I hope some of those questions kind of help set the stage. So the next thing we're gonna do is get into um, some more specifics, I guess, and we're gonna go through each one of these crops in a little bit more detail. But before we do that, I want you to know too that we, um, we do have presentations for specific crops. You've heard me kind of mention that a time or two. So um, you were going to get a survey at the end, of this presentation, but I accidentally sent it to y'all, you know, right before class started, like at 6.30. So there is a survey in there about tonight. So if you fill that out at the bottom, you'll see six crops listed. So um, if if you want more information, actually want, want us to host one of those, it's kind of hard for us to operating outside the office. Don't look, I'm not in my office right now. Um, but we want to provide you with the information that's going to be most useful. So I could say next Monday we're going to do a class on blueberries, but what if only one or two of you wanted to come to that? But maybe, you know, 10 of you want to come to a class on strawberries. So make sure you mark that and whichever one I get the most responses for is going to be the first in-depth fruit class that we do, if that makes sense. So Can you do more than one? Oh yeah, I've got, uh, I've got all six of those, but yeah, we'll just start with one. I just mean, can you um, check more than one? Like if there's two things oh, yeah. you really like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, it's kind of like the survey y'all got last Monday that attended class. And I have not had time to do that because we got the whole plant sale thing that kind of got dumped. So I've not even looked at any of that stuff. So <laughs> I'm going to be doing that in the next couple of days. But we'll have some of that in the pipeline, I promise. But yeah, definitely fill that out because that really helps guide us to know what y'all want and need. Because I don't want to be talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing We're that a lot. <laughs> Okie dokie. Bear with me here. Okay, do you have that introduction to home fruit crops from grazing to groceries? Yes. I know sometimes it takes yes. a while. Okay. All right, so again, this is, um, these are some sessions and modules that we created um, as a home fruit and veggie work group team. Um, we've been working on this for a couple of years now. If some of you may have actually participated in some of our vegetable series and uh, that's kind of how the foundation for the fruit came along for that. So we, again, had a broad overview, but again, we come back to that question. Do you, you know, do you want fruit production? Is that what you're growing it for? If you're growing it just for the edibles or for wildlife, um, you can probably just cut out now because we're going to spend a lot of time, again, going into, into the five S's that I talked about a little bit earlier. So what is possible? Let's look at the, the big picture. And oftentimes, again, it's that one size fits all. It comes back to that philosophy on your personal management style. And there's nothing wrong with one or the other. It's just a matter of knowing which fruit crop's going to be better, you know, for you to grow. And that's where the five S's come in. And we're going to talk about these in detail. Sun, slope, soil, space, and sweat. My favorite one. I've done a lot of that in the last couple of days. So we, we've got to consider spraying time, what materials we're going to use for spraying because it is um, a 12-month endeavor for, for most of these fruit crops. Uh, we really have to consider site management on the pruning, training time, if we having to install a trellis. Uh, wildlife management is going to be critical for some of these. And then harvest time. We don't want to grow uh, multiple fruit crops and have them all coming in at one time. So that's another thing we've kind of got to separate out some of those harvest times. Even if we're growing just blueberries, rabbit eyes are going to produce or um, produce a crop a little bit quicker than what our hibish are. So <clears throat> We can be very effective, irregardless, if we're going the conventional route with chemicals or if we're going organic. Uh, obviously, this we, we kind of get a giggle out of this picture. Obviously, this is, this is not going to be one of those management styles that we're going to utilize in today's world, but it's still a good picture nonetheless and how they did it back in the, back in the day. Another thing to consider is new pests. We all know uh, we've encountered several of these not not necessarily within the fruit crops, but I talked about this last Monday, the um, southern pine beetle damage, the hemlock woolly adelgid, the emerald ash borer. You know, so many of these invasive species are coming in to East Tennessee and wreaking havoc um, with a lot of our, our hardwoods. Well, the same thing in our fruit crops, and the biggest one to hit the horizon has been this spotted wing drosophila. And um, yeah, I say that with me. We, we do not like this pest. It's, it's very hard to control because oftentimes you, you don't know that it's an issue until you have harvested that fruit. So it's this, I think there's some slides toward the end about, about this little critter, but basically he'll drill into the ripe fruit and it's maggots. And um, nobody wants maggots in their fruit, right? So, you know, when we first got this in Greene County, it was when the jam house, uh, we had several growers in the area that was taking blackberries and raspberries to him. Well, he called and he was like, is there something going on with the blackberry crop? Because all these maggots are in the berries. And it was like, oh, no, we've got it. And sure enough, like, you know, the grower didn't know that because you don't see them until they start juicing. So one of the biggest things that we can do is to just make sure we're harvesting that fruit when it's ripe. We don't, we don't want that fruit to get overripe because that's going to draw those uh, spotted wings in a little bit more in abundance. So make sure we're, we're harvesting on time. But this is something to consider as you move into fruit production. Uh, what's going to be possible on your site? 
you know this is not going to be the best site because you're going to have shade all day long somewhere um, in this vineyard so you really want to have eight to ten hours um, per day we want that early morning sun more than that late afternoon because it's going to help dry off dew <clears throat> we want a gentle slope and we want it to be uniform because that's going to provide for a better air and water drainage uh, an uneven slope especially if we're having to install a trellis system it's going to be a little bit harder to do that plus you start getting into those more variable soil conditions and you, you know how bad that is here in, in green and washington and carter county that can be uh, pretty pronounced in some areas uh, raised beds can be a, a great way to uh, fix this problem especially blueberries or cane berries uh, we have many growers that are <clears throat> that are doing it that way in the backyard my allergies you know i drive a red car but it's yellow now so also the reason why i'm wearing glasses instead of contacts because i'm just want to claw them out but anyway i digress uh soil that's going to be one of our s's of course soil ph is going to be very critical again for those blueberries We've got to think about rooting depth for some of these crops. A lot of folks don't realize that we need to be in that 30 to 36 inch range. Uh, we need uh, low to moderate fertility. We want it to be um, well drained, but we also want it to have good water holding capacity. Again, raised beds can, can give you an advantage about some of those issues. Uh, a lot of these fruit crops though, should never follow veggies. Um, verticillium wilt. If you have like a hoop house or even in, in bare ground like this and you have grown tomatoes, you don't want to follow with strawberries because that disease, verticillium wilt, can go from one to the other and vice versa. So again, when you're starting to move forward with producing fruit and you're going into an area that you've had a garden, really, really make sure you understand that concept because some of those things can carry over. <coughs> We've already talked a little bit about space. And again, this is just very generalized, but it's gonna give you a good starting point. Um, it's, it's all gonna be dependent a lot on the various cultivars within those species. Um, what else is gonna impact that space need? Um, when, when you need more than one variety for that pollination, that's gonna be a big issue. And you see down there again with blueberries, it's gonna be preferred for high bush, so you could get away with not, but you really do need to do that. Uh, sweat and time, um, mechanization's not gonna be a factor for home gardeners, uh, for backyard fruit production, and, and fruit's often gonna be a long-term investment, and I think you've seen a lot of that, you know, already throughout the presentation tonight. You know, a lot of these crops are gonna be in existence uh, for a while. Even strawberries, even though they're just you know a couple of years you're you're still going to have those uh, to contend with uh, from year to year so this slide just gives you a broad um, overview of harvest periods uh, you can kind of tell again if when you're planting these if you're wanting to grow multiple crops you don't want fruit all coming in at the same time and of course you know apples are going to be later season whereas strawberries are going to be early season and then you can grow blueberries, caneberries, kind of in the middle. And even there, you can kind of see with raspberries and blackberries, it's going to depend on primocane versus floricane, which we'll talk about in a little while. But lots of different things are going to impact those harvest periods. Uh, the calendar here is just giving you a, a brief overview of what's going on throughout the calendar year. And you can see, again, it, there, there are a lot of things, even in January and, and February, um, getting those cover sprays on, in February, pruning, January, February, all of those things need to be taking place, uh, you know, before that um, switch gets flipped for that plant to start growing again in the springtime. Uh, this just gives you an idea of from, you know, harvest is what we're all looking at. That's what the end, end goal, the end game is always going to be. So this is usually what most people are going to think about first. So this kind of gives you a, an overview of planting to your first harvest, planting to your full crop, and then what the life expectancy is for each one of those. So um, you can see there pretty broad range, of course, cane berries, 
they're going to be a little bit lower investment on the front end, but they're also not going to have that long of a, a life expectancy either. Same way with strawberries. Um, I've known some people that grow on matted row systems that are pretty detailed, pretty OCD, uh, really good at maintenance, and they can extend that crop out to even seven or eight years. Um, but, but they're being really diligent in their, in their maintenance efforts. And you can see there in the difference between your semi-dwarf and your full dwarf apple trees. And again, apples, it, that's a two hour class on its own. Um, many of you probably <clears throat> know that, but lots of different things are gonna influence uh, you know, some of that. And oftentimes when we, when we talk about fruit production from the standpoint of extension, you know, one of the first things, I'll go back to blueberries, but uh, you know, we'll say you want to thin that fruit. Don't let that fruit or don't let that blueberry bush fruit for the first couple of years. We don't want any production. And people will just look at me like I'm crazy. They're like, well, what is the point? You know, I'm, I'm wanting to plant these blueberries because I want fruit. But it's really, really critical. And it's not just for blueberries. It's, it's for all of these, maybe a little bit more critical for blueberries. But you want to get everything below the soil line perfect first. You want that plant to put all of its energy into the underground because when we get that plant good and established, then it's going to produce for us even better for years to come, if that makes sense. So, you know, it's it's hard for us to do, but just don't just don't let those blueberries fruit the first couple of years. And um, it'll provide you better sustainability in the long run. Um, I like this picture because I guess this is a melody slide, you know, match your fruit with your life. You know, I kind of preface the presentation by that because if we weren't in quarantine, you know, I go all the time, whether it's work or whether it's play, um, I pretty well stay on the road. And, um, you know, I obviously can't really grow a fruit crop. You know, I, I take out in July to go for a national conference and I'll extend my time for a week, you know, to explore wherever I'm at. And I'll come back to a garden that's like, oh, was well, there a garden there? Look at all those lovely weeds, you know, and you can't eat all weeds. You know, I'm always one of those that says you can eat all weeds. Well, some of those of them prickly cuckleburs and stuff are not too edible, you know. So um, I have to be really careful about my timing when I'm planting a garden. And so fruit, I can maybe get away with a few strawberries, um, but anything else, it's going to be pretty tough. So, you know, that's, that's something you really need to consider when you're, if, you know, my, my dad's a snowbird. He, he flies south for the wintertime. So, you know, that's another issue. And um, in the summer months, sometimes they travel camping and, th and things like that. So they're not going to they're not going to have an opportunity to grow a fruit crop. So really, really take that into consideration when you're thinking about growing fruit. So let's distill that down. Of course, you know, we're in Northeast Tennessee, so we got to have a moonshine reference in there somewhere. So uh, we've had a lot of information thrown at us tonight. So, you know, we, we just got to kind of determine again where we fall on this spectrum. So we thought long and hard how to present this um, to folks like you that it would make maybe a little bit more sense, you know, kind of make it, make an analogy of sorts. So we broke this out into three different tiers. So tier one is for someone that does what it takes. So picture our rose growers, and many of you are master gardeners. So many of you are rose growers and you spend an enormous amount of time in your gardens and your landscape. Um, but it takes a long time to, to grow the perfect rose, right? It's not just something we go out there and you know, it just grows by itself. There's a lot of issues that um, you have to think about when you're growing roses. So a, a lot of our rose growers are pretty meticulous about their craft, right? Well, that's kind of the same thing about our tier one fruit, fruit growers. They're going to maybe have a little bit more space. They're going to be a little bit pickier about the site. Um, they're one of those that can just look at an apple tree and know exactly where to prune. And I hate those people, by the way. So if you're one of those, nah, because uh, I had to really sit and think about that for a long time. But um, these tier one growers, they're going to be willing to spray regularly. That 12 months is not, not going to affect them. They're going to be committed to netting or, or training on a trellis or, you know, getting that netting over um, their fruit. If any of you were at the pruning demonstration at Dave Effler's, he is a tier one grower. He's very meticulous about that. So, You'll, you'll notice here strawberries, blueberries, caneberries, apples, 
uh, table and wine grapes, muscadines and, and peach are gonna be some of your more challenging. Um, let's see. Yeah, these are gonna take the most time in pruning and pest and disease management. Uh, they're gonna be the ones that are gonna take up more space anywhere. And soil depth and light, crucial, because some sites are just not gonna work for some of those. And then of course, wildlife protection. So then we move into tier two. Uh, and those are gardeners uh, that are gonna be like, I do okay. I'd probably throw myself into this category. Uh, perennial gardeners, um, we're not gonna be as time invested. Maybe COVID-19 is changing some of that for, for a lot of us. But you're trying to, to maximize uh, your impact of time and what you're spending uh, a little bit more conscientious of some of those uh, inputs and the practices, you know when they need to be occurring and, and that and that type of thing. Uh, blueberries and caneberries can be productive uh, with some regular uh, pruning and spraying. Again, it's gonna be hard to grow any fruit crop in Northeast Tennessee without some kind of spray control program. Again, be it organic or conventional. That's why we really, really encourage integrated pest management um, for any crop. Um, tier two, I'm gonna have a knowledge of disease resistant cultivars. You're gonna know when and where to use those. You know irrigation might be an issue. You're gonna know uh, overhead irrigation's a little bit worse than uh, drip. Uh, you know that size can still enable you to fit into a, a wide range of size. You know, we, we've got a lot of creative folks. I see a lot of creative folks on Zoom tonight. So oftentimes that space, is, uh, space issue is not necessarily gonna be an issue. And then we have our tier three growers. And these are the growers that say, I don't kid myself. And you see that picture of marigolds. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with marigold growers or with this category. It's just probably being cognizant of the fact, maybe that's more like I probably have been in the last few years. You know, I, I know that I'm not gonna spend a lot of time because I'm just not here to spend time. Space often is gonna be an issue and then the, the big thing here though is folks want that immediate gratification. So sometimes tier three growers are not gonna be the most patient. I'm starting to describe myself a little bit more for tier three, aren't I? But anyway, uh, disease resistance, cultivar selection. If you're writing this down, make sure you put this down because the best offense is a good defense, right? I've kind of touched on this a little bit already, but this is where it's, it's really gonna be. We've We've really got to know what's gonna grow best here um, in our own backyard. Uh, we cannot grow uh, tree species here that they're necessarily even growing in, in Memphis. Um, we've got to really investigate those chilling hours. What is growing in Alma, Georgia is not a species that we're gonna be able to grow here, no matter how much we, we might like it because our chilling hours are gonna be different. Um, so again, this the cultivar selection, immediately we're starting out with that most disease resistant cultivar, and that's given us the best chance um, for fruitful um, production. And you see there, that's gonna be covered in the next session. Like there's six of these, so we get into a lot more detail in some of our other sessions on that. But um, a, a question that we get often is, do I really need to spray all that? Uh, you'll notice here that second bullet, cultural practices are going to be the biggest factor for any of us as fruit growers. Even when we get into those tier one growers, our commercial growers, if we're starting with good cultural practice, maintaining good sanitation, uh, good variety selection, great site selection, we're getting that good water and air drainage, we've got adequate sunlight, uh, we're performing those maintenance um, schemes every year with pruning, um, we're promoting that airflow, we're getting rid of all that disease material. And if we were in person right now, I'd ask for a show of hands, but I won't do that because, again, I can't see all of you, but you know, how many of us are growing a crop, say, of grapes? And we're gonna talk about black rot and mummy bearing a little bit, but we prune all that out, but we leave it laying. Well, all we're doing is just manifesting more spores and more disease pressure, not just for us this year, but for other crops maybe in the area, but also for, for years to come. That can be a persistent issue. So, you know, when we're removing some of that diseased and dead plant material, 
my favorite word is we need to burn it. We need to get rid of that material because then we're adequately getting rid of all those spores that are wreaking havoc um, on all of our fruit crops. Uh, if you go to uthort.com, you're going to find a lot of resources there for our tree and small fruits. Um, PB1622 is our disease and insect control and home fruit plantings. If I have time, I'm going to show you that when we finish, um, finish up with the presentation. Plus, you'll get this in your packet. Um, this is, I think it's 12 pages that y'all get. I don't know if you can see me because I can't see myself. But you see how thick this book is. This is our plant and disease or what is it, insect and plant disease manual. So, you know, even as extension agents, we have to refer to this because that's a lot of material, right? So basically we've con condensed down for fruit crops into some pretty specific um, chemicals, rates, pre-harvest intervals, and, and that kind of thing for you. So it's a pretty quick reference, especially if you're growing fruit to have that on hand. So again, does, does fruit uh, really suit your lifestyle? Big basic questions to ask. Those five S's again. Really think about what your management philosophy is and pair that with your crop and cultivar selection, which is going to be your most critical. And then uh, success is just largely a factor of avoiding failure, right? That's a Natalie Bumgarner quote for those of you that know Natalie. So, <clears throat> so from there we say go forth and grow fruit. And so now we're going to get into some of those brief crop overviews. And again, I've said this more than once tonight. This is just very, very broad. So I hope you kind of see where we started from and we got a little bit deeper and now we're going to branch out into some more specifics. So hopefully this is again going to whet your appetite, get you mulling over things. Many of you are probably already um, growing fruit, but hopefully this is just going to give you some more things to be thinking about and then we'll delve a little bit deeper in some of our future classes. <clears throat> Blueberries, um, sight and timing is going to be pretty critical here. And you, again, you see that high bush is going to ripen a little bit quicker than our rabbit eye. Rabbit eye typically performs a little bit better here in northeast Tennessee, so just jot that down. Um, especially um, what I consider newbie gardeners will have a little bit better success with those rabbit eyes. Again, that soil pH is probably more critical. Uh, for blueberries than, than the cultivar. This would be the, the one crop that that would be a little bit reversed on. You'll see there again that first crop, third year, no exceptions. Go out there and make yourself pinch those blooms off. Don't, don't let it fruit. Uh, yield per plant is usually about 15 pounds. That's going to vary again because when we get into high bush we've got, um, well actually I think that's next slide, we've got two different kind of high bush. But the rabbit eye, that's going to be the tallest, um, longer lived. It's going to be that last one to ripen. But there's, there's the reason that it does so well here is because it's more tolerant of heat and drought. And again, you know, we get those wet springs usually and then we move into a drier, you know, Jul late July, August, September. Uh, the northern high bush, that's the one that's going to require those higher chilling hours. So when we get into the blueberry crop specific in a, in a different um, segment where we spend a lot of time on those chilling hours with blueberries and peaches. But the northern high bush is going to be the most cold tolerant and you're going to have more disease issues with those. So, you know, tier two, tier three, not, not a tier two, uh, tier two here instead of a tier three. The southern high bush that was actually created uh, for um, bred for low chilling hours, but that's the one that's been the tested and research trials and everything, the least amount here in Tennessee. So um, the biggest thing to remember is if you are going with those southern high bush cultivars is to choose a cultivar with a higher chilling hour. Uh, to bounce back to the rabbit eye, uh, they're going to be a little bit more adaptable to the soil. So if that pH is not right to start with, again rabbit eye is probably going to be the best bet because of that tolerance to heat. Um, they're going to be a little bit later fruiting. Northern high bush, uh, they're going to be a little bit pickier about site, uh, those drainage issues. Uh, a northern high bush is going to tell you when its feet are wet, and usually it does it in a way that's not too nice, so be really careful with that. It's going to yield a little bit better at those higher elevations, so along, along the uh, North Carolina line again, this is where those are going to perform a little bit better versus um, up in the Bellaton area. 
that southern high bush again it's newer um, it's going to give us a little bit earlier harvest though and it's going to be those big fat juicy berries but ozark blue um, is, has just been released from the University of Arkansas. And just an FYI, if you're into blueberries or cane berries, Arkansas is where you need to go. Uh, Google them for cultivar. I'm actually gonna send you a cultivar in your packet with cultivars because they've got an excellent breeding program um, out there and they're really starting to put out some, some pretty good stuff. We've actually got some of that going into um, our trials. This is actually in Spring Hill, but uh, Spring Hill and Greenville have the same blueberry uh, trial. So uh, we're looking on getting some data on the southern high bush. So we've got nine different varieties, actually 10 because we do have a what we call a guard plant in each one of those two. So uh, you're going to see more of that coming out. We just planted last year and we had to replant a lot this year because we did everything that I've been telling you not to do. We did all that last year. So um, I don't like to admit that, but I think that was one of the critical elements and a little bit of that failure that that persisted for us this year. So you might as well just own it and be honest with it because uh, we literally flew by the seat of our pants. We, we planted those blueberries April 18th last year and, and got the sulfur to amend the soil to jerk that pH from a 6.8 all the way down to a 4.5 just uh, you know 10 days before we planted. So never wise to do that. Uh, that would have been an excellent location for us to have gone out and looked at that uh, because you could really see that. Some of you on here actually did see that. Uh, so now we'll move into just a few diseases. And again, I'm, I'm not gonna spend an enormous amount of time because you know, plant path pathology is my thing. So I could go for days. So I'm gonna try to spare you all that. But um, mummy berry, hang on a minute, I got a picture here. Um, and I put, you know, the fungal name up there if that's something you wanna research. But uh, you can see what the berry looks like. I'm pointing like y'all can see what I'm pointing at but you can actually if I do this can y'all see that see yeah there mummy berry uh, but you'll get this in the vein you'll see that discolor uh, discoloration of the mid vein and then the the blooms will be twisted that's one of the reasons it's called mummy berry uh, Phomopsis, you're going to see this on a lot of different fruit crops um, oftentimes we'll think that it's just you know a branch that's died back or it's got nipped by something. Um, but if you ever see that on a blueberry, investigate it just a tad bit closer because that can be a fungal organism. And as far as disease management, again, it just goes back to some of those cultural practices, raking and removing all that plant litter, and that's just gonna help reduce that inoculum. Uh, prune out and destroy all those dead twigs and branches. And a preventative may be needed. It just depends on that prevalence that you've had in previous years. Um, and again, if you've had disease pressure for any of those, you're always going to have that issue. So keep that in mind. You're, you're, never, you're never really going to get rid of the, of the issue. And you'll notice for blueberries, there's just a couple. You know, we used to say blueberries and pears were the two easiest crops to grow organically because you never really needed to to worry too much about um, disease or insect, but now with the spotted wing, uh, Drosophila, that's become an issue. Uh, moving into strawberries, again, it's going to be dependent on the type that we're growing, uh, short day versus ever ever bearing or day neutral. Um, you can pull a double crop off of these um, if you know what you're doing. We've tried that a, a few times in trials when I was in North Carolina. Uh, the biggest factor here is just good um, drainage. The pH is going to be just like our garden crops. Uh, your first crop, this is why this, is, this one is a winner in a lot of our backyard systems is because you're getting fruit and under a year typically. So um, you want to be careful again, don't follow tomatoes with strawberries and vice versa. Same thing with um, peppers, eggplant, potatoes, because those are all, all in the solanaceous family, just like tomato, um, and they can all spread the same disease. So make sure when you're doing that crop rotation that you're not following strawberries, I mean tomatoes with strawberries. So your types there are the short day, which we also call June bearing, which are pretty popular here. They're going to fruit later in the spring. Uh, they're going to be vegetative during those long days of summer and uh, fruit bud uh, takes place uh, under late season short day conditions. 
ever bearing, most of these are going to be long day. Uh, late spring and late summer, early fall crops can be achieved. You're going to have few runners. Some people prefer that. They don't like all those runners going everywhere, but you're going to have multiple plants, multiple crowns. And then we have our day neutral. Those are not going to be controlled um, by day length at all. They're going to fruit that first year, but they're going to be really small. Typically, I think they're pretty sweet. Um, but hot temperatures, really, really hot, can disrupt their growth. So just be aware of that. Not that any of us can predict Mother Nature, but again, depending on our site location, uh, some of us may not be able to pull off a crop of the day neutral as well as others, just depending, depending on where we're at. Uh, matted row, this is primarily what most of our fruit production is going to look like in the, in the backyard, in our home garden situation, because this is the most common method. Um, it does take a little time to manage and renovate. Uh, sometimes, if you're OCD like me, it can, it can look too weedy and too overrun, and you just want to do something um, with it. It can be a little bit tedious. Uh, again, that goes back to management style. But again, years to bearing is about a year and a half. Uh, you can pull off three or four years of production. Again, that's what I was talking about earlier. You can even get up to seven or eight if you're managing really well. Uh, 25 plants can yield up to about a, a, a pound per plant in a year. This is a young planting of matted row. You can kind of see what that looks like. You see that the soil is exposed all around. Oftentimes when we think matted row, we automatically envision uh, the straw that's in the middles or placed over top of the of the plant itself because we're doing that for winter protection. But when we first make that planting, we need to make sure we're establishing good um, seed to soil contact, if you will, um, because we want those runners to be able to spread. And then um, plastic culture or hill planting, that's what you're gonna see a lot of our commercial folks do down on the river. It's gonna be in, in late fall and they're gonna be using plug transplants or those greenhouse runner tips. Um, we've got some home gardeners that are starting to adopt this practice, um, but um, it typically it's just more attractive because of the shorter duration of the planting. So, and it's a little bit more controlled as far as the method with mulch and raised beds, and you can kind of see what the difference there is. And again, strawberries, um, because they are suitable for small space, makes them very popular. Fastest reward on your investment. Uh, the flavor, of course, is outstanding. And then probably the lowest input cost of any of um, our other fruit crops. And again, it's all about getting creative because you can grow strawberries hanging upside down. You can grow them in gutters. Um, you can grow them in buckets and in tires. Pretty, they, as long as they've got room to start running, they'll you can produce a crop of strawberries anywhere. Strawberries have a little bit more disease pressure than our blueberries, and these are gonna be very significant in Northeast Tennessee, again, because of mother nature, because of the climate, um, wet spring, coupled with high humidity. We go from one, typically right into another. So we, we saw this on blueberry, and we also see this on strawberry, and you can kind of see those concentric rings, that's one way, it almost looks like uh, tree rings. That's one way we can identify that as being the leaf blight. And typically it'll start um, just as a spot and it starts coalescing into one. And it'll start from the interior and move to the outside. And thracnose, this is probably the most prevalent disease that we have in Northeast Tennessee. Uh, we'll you probably even actually purchase fruit at the grocery store or the farmer's market that's had these little blotches on it. And that is just a fungal organism. Um, oftentimes, if you can catch that at this stage, well, not necessarily this stage because this is old growth, but if you can catch it in the crown because it's going to affect all parts of the plant, if you can get a fungicide on there before the fruit starts bearing, it often won't affect uh, the fruit. One of the keys here is to make sure we've got that straw mulch or some kind of covering on the soil because that's going to help reduce that splash when it rains. We're not getting that splash up on the fruit. And oftentimes that's going to serve as an, a, a host for any kind of fungal disease is when it's laying right on the ground. 
Uh, red steel disease, it's a root rot disease. Um, it's, it's a water mold. Again, we have those conditions pretty prevalent here in East Tennessee. Um, this is one that you can get cultivars that have resistance. Uh, so it's not as big an issue today as it was even 10 years ago. But again, it goes back to reading the label, really knowing what, what you're getting. Uh, leather rod is starting to um, gain a little bit more of a foothold in regards to disease. Sometimes you'll hear us call it Phytophthora, and you'll hear us use that um, pretty frequently throughout the growing season because this is going to affect many crops, not just strawberries. But obviously strawberries are going to suffer pretty bad because that's half the fruit gone, right? And, and it's one of those things you can't really eat around or cut around because even as soft as it is here, it's still going to be mushy. I don't know if you can see that indention right there. It's still going to be mushy even into the in, internal component of the fruit here. And then gray mold, botrytis, you'll hear us refer to that as well and many other crops. But botrytis is going to be any mold that's covered in that gray, um, almost like talcum powder look. Um, and that is a fungal organism. So all of that that you see right here is that's live spores. It's active, which means it's actively reproducing. So all it needs is a carrier to go off and infect other strawberries. Uh, as far as management, it's going to again depend on what we got present. All of those were uh, fungal organisms. So most of those are going to be able to be controlled with the same chemical if we're going that route. But if you're maintaining the proper plant row spacing and you're getting that good sunlight penetration and airflow through there, that's the biggest thing you can do uh, to reduce disease. Um, and of course, by controlling weeds, that's going to help, help both of those along. Use that straw mulch again. That's just going to help reduce soil splash. That's a good idea to get into with any of those crops that are going to be lying on the ground for any length of time even cucumbers, squash, melons, or anything like that. And you see I keep referring to 1622. This is that 12 pager that I'm going to send you after class. Caneberries, uh, we used to collectively term these as brambles, but now with these new cultivars being created, we have gone to using caneberries because brambles means thorny. So what have we bred out? Of blackberries and raspberries. We bred out a lot of that thorniness and I'll give you Melody's personal philosophy. I kind of like those thorny bushes. It takes me back to my childhood, number one, but I think the quality of flavor is a little bit higher on some of those, uh, I guess you would call them wild blackberries now versus uh, the, the what we call the tame. Uh, but ripening time is going to be summer through early fall. You're going to have many options when it comes to the cane berries. Um, pH again is going to be very similar to our garden veggies. You want to stay from away from wild blackberry plants. That's what wild rubus is uh, because you're going to see a picture here in a minute of a disease that uh, wild blackberries or tame blackberries that are planted in the vicinity of wild blackberries can cause. Um, you're going to have your first crop in a, about the second year and a full crop the third year. Um, as far as our cane berries, again, blackberries and raspberries. Raspberries are going to grow in fruit best with those cooler summers and moderate winters. Uh, think Lexington, Kentucky, those areas in the, in the bluegrass are going to be a little bit better for, for production there. Tennessee is going to be marginal, um, so you're going to need to maintain those a little bit better than we would blackberries. There are even yellow fruited. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that. It's kind of like a yellow watermelon. It may be philosophical. I don't think the sugar is there. Of course, you know, the higher um, some of those lycopenes and everything that are associated with the color, I think, you know, it, it also affects that sugar content as well. So, uh, but there are some yellow um, raspberries out there. Red are going to be most suited for our area and some red and yellow are going to be primocane berries. We're going to talk about those differences here in a minute. Blackberries are going to grow uh, well in our summer temps here. You're going to have the thorn and thornless variety. You're going to have erect and semi-erect. It's going to again depend on how much you want to invest in a trellis system. Most of our bears are going to be floricane and there's a few primocane. Again, Dave Effler, if you went to the pruning demo, 
um, had a few of those growing on his place. You can see some of the differences there. That makes me hungry. So the, the difference there in primocane and floricane is just that cane growth and the fruit bud initiation, um, when it's going to bloom, when it's going to fruit, and then your cane death. So you can basically, let me put this one up. Um, if it's floricane bearing, you have that primocane that's created that, that first year, you're going to get the growth of that cane, and you're going to have fruit bud initiation in the late summer. And then the next year, we're going to call that a floricane. That's the second year of life. That's when that's going to fruit, and then that's going to die back. So this is where we're, we're going to see this on blackberries, and then black and purple raspberries. i got to move that little screen out of the way because I can't see the screen. So primocane, again, you're going to have that uh, it, the primocane is going to grow in the branches and it fruits all in the upper portion of that plant in the summer and into the fall. And then it's going to die back after it fruits. No more fruit can be produced on that old wood. And then the second year of life, that fruiting is going to occur on the lower portion. So it's kind of cool. Um, but it's going to fruit on the lower portion in early summer and then it's going to completely die back after it's fruited. So you can pull a double crop on a primocane crop. So that's why some folks want to go with the primocane versus the floricane, just for that reason. But sometimes um, you'll just grow it for one crop and that's perfectly okay to do too. As far as diseases, this is the one I was gonna talk to you about with the wild blackberries. Um, some of you may have seen this. This also occurs on hollyhocks. If anybody grows hollyhocks, this can be pretty prevalent in those. We've talked about anthracnose, uh, so this can also um, be an issue with blackberries. And then this one is leaf spot. Different sorts of fungi can affect this. Um, this is one that's gonna be kind of hard to pinpoint specifics, but anytime those spots are coalescing together or reducing photosynthesis, which is how the plant makes food, right? And as far as management, again, just remove those wild brambles, make sure we're managing weeds. Don't let fruit get too ripe. Sometimes it's hard to do um, with, with blackberries um, because they don't all ripen at the same time. But you typically don't need a preventative fungicide um, for blackberries or raspberries. So now we're gonna move into grapes. And you know, I, this is kind of what I picture. I, I just see that as a lot of wine. Y'all, so speaking of wine, we got two different types, wine grapes, table grapes. So our wine grapes are those um, Vitis vinifera, typically, again, Chardonnay, Cabernet, uh, Zinfandels, that's the European bunch grape, but it's a pain to grow here just because of the uh, pest uh, pressure and the climate. Uh, some of the French American hybrids are gonna fall into that uh, category too. We often say that uh, wine grapes could probably grow pretty prevalently in the north end of the county because of all that shale soil that they have up there because we don't want a really high, highly fertile soil. Uh, spraying, that's gonna be pretty much essential if you want to get into growing wine grapes. And you'll notice there, best left for those with time and experience. So for those of us that enjoy wine, we'll just drink it and we'll let all those invest the time. Uh, then we have table grapes, and those are going to be Vitis Labrusca, those American Bunch uh, grapes. Uh, you can use some of those for wine. Obviously, Concord is going to be one of those. Uh, they're self-fruitful. You're going to need about six to, foot, uh, six to eight foot spacing for those. And again, spraying is going to be critical. Uh, another thing to just make mention, because I don't know if that's in here or not, but if you want to grow Concords, Concords don't ripen at the same time, which can be an issue. And I'm not talking about the bunch, I'm talking about individual berries within the bunch. So there's a variety called Sunbelt that's just like, I mean, it's a Concord cultivar, but they ripen at the same time. So if you're wanting to grow for uh, jams and jellies, that might be one of those um, varieties you wanna look into. As far as muscadines, that's the rotundifolia species, that's native to here. So there's very few disease issues. Um, it's only gonna be grown in warmer parts of Tennessee. We're kind of right on that cusp because we're 7A. So anything zone seven and above, that's that big, large fruit, uh, muscadines and scuppernog. Uh, of course, that's gonna be those bronze colored grapes. They're gonna be very, very, 
very vigorous. These are, you know, when I was talking earlier about pruning in the summertime, grapes are going to be the exception to that. You can actually cut those back during the summer months, but you're going to, it's going to require a male plant for a pollinator. And you can see again why it's such a, an investment. I mean, we're, we're looking out at uh, the fourth year before we start cropping because it's all again about establishing that plant, getting that trellis system, getting that, that um, actually, here's a good picture, getting that grape established to grow in the way we want it to. Because you know, when we first buy grapes, they just wanna go everywhere, right? So we actually have to train them to do what uh, we want them to do. So a trellis system is gonna be critical. We're not gonna get into all the details of that tonight, but it's gonna be pretty critical um, primarily for disease issue. Uh, site, site orientation is going to be more critical for grapes than it is probably any of the other fruit crops. We don't want any um, water, any dew, any fog to linger on those leaves because that's just a breeding ground uh, for disease. And speaking of, these are some of the ones I was talking about and all of these are so prevalent in Northeast Tennessee. But the thing is, if, if we see these little spots, and you see how that's kind of orangish yellow and then it's got that blackish purple ring around it. If we see that now, before we get here, we can oftentimes prevent this from happening. So that's why it's real critical to be out and um, scouting your vines. Even if you've just got a couple of vines, get out there and really look um, to see if you see this going on. Yeah, well, okay, we've already seen that. Oh, the other thing is that it does actually infect the entire plant. It can even go up the stem too. So we want to make sure that we control that as early as we can. Powdery mildew, we hear this all the time if we're growing cucurbit crops, uh, squash, uh, and pumpkins, any of those are gonna be really um, prevalent to catch powdery or downy mildew, but powdery mildew, you can see there, you get the powder, on the top of the leaf. Downy's gonna be on the underside of the, well, I'll show you that in a minute. But powdery, that's one way to distinguish. It's always gonna be on the top. And then if we are fruiting, you're gonna see it actually manifest itself in the berries as well. Downy's gonna occur on the underside. And again, you're, you're gonna notice it's an oomycete, which means it's gonna be um, um, not airborne, it's gonna be waterborne. Uh, and you can see what it looks like. Again, uh, this is usually, where homeowners or our commercial growers will start, start to notice the issue is when we get that burning along the edges. Uh, again, pruning those vines to promote airflow, uh, getting that fungicide uh, penetration in there, that's gonna be the best thing that we can do. When we're removing all that dead wood and any mummified fruit, we want to, to burn that material. And then we're gonna get into apples. Um, of course, sight's gonna be critical, full sun, morning light, again, to dry those leaves off. We want a deep soil. It's gonna be well-drained, but we don't want it to be droughty. Uh, Rootstocks are gonna dictate size here. Uh, uh, Cross-pollination is gonna be required. You can't just plant one, and we've got to consider susceptib susceptib susceptibility to diseases. So this will kind of serve as just a really brief intro, again, because we could spend so much time on apples and I don't even know what time it is. We're getting close to time anyway. Uh, but you can kind of see there the difference between seedling, semi-dwarf, and dwarf trees. And you can see the amount of, of uh, time it's gonna take to get us to our first crop um, versus how long those trees are gonna live in our orchard. And you, and you see there, the dwarf is 14, 15. We can see those progress a little longer than that. But again, it's gonna take um, some pretty intensive management skills to, to get us there. If we're starting with a seedling, it's going to take, you know, a little while for us to get to fruiting, obviously, um, but you can have a longer, longer lived orchard if you go that route too. As far as resistant apple cultivars, uh, Liberty is probably going to be the most popular here. Notice that, that scale around there. Um, we're going to talk about some of these diseases in just a minute, but Apple scab rates a nine, which is which is pretty pretty good. Cedar apple rust is one that is just ridiculous this time of year. Powdery mildew and then fire blight. So you can see there, Liberty has a lot to offer us in, in that realm and probably one of the better performers 
for Northeast Tennessee. Um, pears are going to be really similar to apple because they are a palm. Uh, you're going to have some that are going to be self-pollinating, but many are going to require that cross-pollination. So just go ahead and get in the mindset that you need that cross-pollination. Uh, they're going to bloom a little bit earlier too, which can cause some uh, spring losses. Uh, disease is going to be the, the biggest issue with pears. Now it used to not be that way uh, 20 years ago. Uh, but some of the, the most well-known pears, like the European, uh, they're going to do poorly here in East Tennessee, unfortunately, just because of the fire blight pressure, which is a good lead into this. So uh, it almost, well, I mean, it's fire blight. It looks like it's been scorched. Um, and this is a bacterial disease. You know, we've been talking about fungal diseases primarily with all these fruit crops up until now. And when we think fungal, as bad as it is, because it's spores and they can be carried by wind and water, and they can be very prevalent just because of our climatic conditions here. But typically, you can control those pretty easily uh, compared to any bacterial disease or a viral disease. Um, because you, get, you gotta think about even us as humans. Uh, use us as an, an analogy. So. Um, if we get a, a bacterial disease, we take antibiotics, right? If we get a viral disease, God forbid, I don't want to talk about COVID-19, but, you know, that's one that's, that we really don't, you know, we don't have any control for, right? So it's not just in humans uh, with any kind of viral um, organism, you know, whether we get the flu or Epstein-Barr or whatever that may be, uh, there's nothing out there that we can just take to cure that. And so bacteria is kind of the the middle of the road, you know, fungal is really easy to control, virus is not, bacteria, sometimes we just need to stimulate uh, the defense mechanism in that tree. So that's where some of those uh, copper compounds, uh, sulfur, or elemental compounds are going to come into play. So, you know, be, you know, be it organic or conventional, having some of those elemental, um, like sulfur again, and, and copper are going to be really good for fruit production because they're going to help stimulate that immune system. And this is one too, the Arwenia, we're going to see that in multiple crops too. So fire blight, very devastating. That's why it's so critical. Cannot specify this enough to know the cultivar before you plant. That's why um, growing those pears is going to be so hard to do here because we don't have any fire blight resistance. So you hear me repeat some of this stuff because I just want it to, to sink in. It's going to be really tough to do that. Apple scab, again, is a fungus, so a little bit easier to control, but uh, think about potato scab. So you can see that this is very ugly. Uh, you know, aesthetically speaking, we might not want to purchase that fruit, right? Uh, whereas some of those fungal organisms I was showing you in strawberries, it gets into the in, internal components of the fruit. Scab don't do that. You can cut that out. It's just right there. It's a surface lesion is what that is. It's going to manifest itself in all these little spots, which what, what is happening right here. We're reducing photosynthesis again, right? Um, so we want to catch it early. But if we get to this point in fruit production, you can still eat that. It's just ugly. And it's the same thing, again, with potato scab. Um, that's just a lot of that's just soil moisture conditions. Same thing here. It's going to be driven, um, you know, by water and wind, those spores being carried. Cedar apple rust, uh, this is the hell child of East Tennessee, for lack of better terminology. I'm sure most of us have all seen these galls growing on cedars, right? It's pretty cool. It is, it's got these weird tentacles and, and we see them growing pretty prolific in March around these parts. But uh, the cool thing about this is that they need each other to be one or the other. So from a, from a cedar to an apple tree. Uh, when you see these bright little orange spots and we get, get these little, this little orange color around the leaf margin, then we know that we're dealing with um, cedar apple rust. And the bad thing about it is when this little thing is on a cedar tree, there's just millions of little spores in there. More so than, think again back to those strawberry plants when I was showing you um, Botrytis. There's a lot more surface area within this little um, cedar gall than there is on that strawberry, right? So you got a lot more spores that are going to be able to float off into the wind and infect apple trees. So what okay. happens is that when these start showing up, 
and they're going to attach themselves to young apple tree leaves. And that's when we start, that's just, that serves as the source for um, inoculum. It's basically a parasite is all it is on the cedar. It's not going to do anything devastating to the Caesar, cedar, but it serves as a, this serves as a host for those spores. Um, it's going to be impossible to get rid of cedars, right? In East Tennessee, because they're so prevalent here. But, you know, if, if you start seeing those spots, a good uh, treatment method would be getting um, immunox. You can apply that material because, again, that's going to stimulate the immune system of that, that tree. Bitter rot, again, you can see this is a little different from scab that we were talking about because scab is just a surface lesion, which means it's only going to be on that outside skin. If we get into bitter rot, again, it almost looks like uh, those little concentric rings. You're going to see those rings, the little halo there on the fruit. You can still eat that. You just got a lot more surface area involved versus the scab. Um, but the thing to remember on all of these, let's see if he's got, because this, um, some of this disease stuff was put together by Zach Hansen, our plant pathologist at UT. Um, again, uh, raking, removing, and destroying all those leaves. We want to reduce that inoculum throughout the winter months. And all of you know, if, as home gardeners, that we're having more and more disease and insect pressure from year to year because our, our climate's kind of shifted. I want to get into that conversation. That's um, a different discussion for a different day. But a lot of those things are affecting uh, life cycles of insects and and disease cycles and things like that. So we want to try to get rid of as much of that source as we can. Uh, removing cedar trees, again, that's going to be almost in, impossible because spores can float for miles. So if we're pruning trees, though, that's going to help us, again, with airflow and removing all that and, and burning it. Um, I was going to say something about, oh, I know what I was going to say. He didn't have that on the slide. Um, make sure that, you know, cultivars, when you're looking at those cultivars, again, fire blight is going to be critical for this area. So that's, that's your best, um, that's your best defense is to just, you know, start right out. It doesn't matter if you like a golden delicious, you, you're going to have fire blight pressure. You know, you're, you're going to be so much more susceptible to a lot of these diseases. So again, do your research, find something you like that's a close second and, and go that route because it's almost like our next topic, peaches, um, is just not, it's just something that just doesn't grow very well here. Um, but if you're going to try uh, morning light again, again to dry off those leaves, uh, a deep well-drained soil, uh, spring frost are the things that it's going to be it's going to be the huge issue here just because uh, when we when we lose those blooms we lose fruit right and um, disease and insect we're really going to have to focus on on that and in our peach uh, session that's what the the multitude of or the biggest chunk of time is going to be spent on is those multitude of diseases that affect our peach crops so uh, they are a little bit shorter in stature than some of our apple species um, and they they will uh, produce fruit a little bit quicker than apples. Of course, it's gonna take about six years to get us to full fruiting. And you'll notice the lifespan there too. Uh, sometimes that's gonna be lower depending on where we're at as far as climate and topography. Uh, we can get an extension on that. Um, Sevier County can grow uh, peaches a little bit better than we can here. Harvest period is gonna be all over the place depending on what species you grow. As far as peach diseases, brown rot is going to be uh, one of the biggest issues. And again, you can see right here all of that active, it's actively sporulating right there. And all of that would have to be removed because it is, it is already, in, it's already decimated that fruit. And then we have bacterial spot. Again, it's a bacterial disease, so it's going to be really hard for us to control that. You can see that yellowing. I often will talk about how several folks will bring uh, samples into the office and often it will be related to physiological issues like pH or fertility. But in peach, when we start seeing that yellow, uh, usually that's going to mean it's bacterial leaf spot versus any kind of um, pH issue. 
Um, it does cause premature leaf drop because it's, and of course defoliation is gonna weaken the tree, which is gonna cause it to be more susceptible again to that winter injury. And you can kind of see the transition there. Um, we don't have the peach tree curl in here, but that's a fungal disease. Bill had asked, I think that's what Bill had asked about earlier. Um, and that's one of those, um, again, if we are spraying, I'm gonna see if I have a picture of this. I don't know if it's in this one. I don't, but um, it's a little round pie chart looking thing that tells you the times to spray. For each crop uh, because a lot of these things can be prevented again it goes back to journaling and knowing what issues you have from year to year so the next year you're going to know um, if, if cedar apple rust was an issue for you this year then you know you're going to have that pressure next year so you need to invest in immunox to be making at those um, at you know timely periods throughout the year to help prevent some of those issues uh, same thing with peach tree curl so all of you are going to get that that little chart that shows you when and with what material you need to be spraying with and it's going to help reduce some of that infection so hopefully you won't lose all of your fruit so uh, you'll notice that some of our most popular uh, varieties of peaches are going to be the ones that are more susceptible to that bacterial spot uh, but you'll also notice that we don't need preventative fungicides we really don't have anything labeled for that um, for peaches like we do in some of our other crops. But just takeaway themes for all of these crops is to make sure, again, we're going back to the variety. If there's nothing you take away from tonight, it's knowing that before you, you know, venture into this journey, you really need to research cultivars, varieties. Um, those five S's are what's going to be really critical for growing any of these. So, um, just knowing that disease pressure in, in Northeast Tennessee is huge and we can't get away from it no matter how hard we try. So that's why we've got to, to select our planting site that's going to have good drainage, uh, good sunlight. And when I'm talking drainage, I mean water, I mean um, air, you know, frost, injury, all of those things come into play. Uh, keep all these plants pruned because that's again going to encourage sustainability of those crops. It's going to encourage airflow and, and rapid drying and that's going to allow any any kind of chemical uh, that we're applying to be able to penetrate and oftentimes not just fungicide penetration. You know um, we, we talk about that because diseases are a little bit more prevalent than some of our insects but insecticide you know we want all of that material to be able to get through there and removing all that dead litter. Uh, learn what some of these common diseases are. If you're going to grow a fruit crop know what those are before you start um, into production. And all these fungicides, if you're growing backyard, uh, you know, or fruit in your backyard and your home gardens, uh, co-op, Ace Hardware uh, are going to probably be your, your best bets because they're going to carry a little bit broader range of some of these chemicals. But your box stores will also carry some of those, but make sure that you're looking at active ingredient versus the brand name. So, you know, when, when we recommend chemicals, we recommend uh, mancozeb, um, which is the active ingredient of manzate, because you know your co-op in Carter County, Ford may not carry um, carry that or vice versa. So always make sure that you're looking at that active ingredient versus the trade name, brand name. Um, organic fungicides, uh, they there are some of those available too, but just make sure that it's labeled for whatever you're using it on. And typically those organic products are gonna be biological or they're gonna be plant um, extract based. So they may not have long-term efficacy. So just keep that in mind. And we've talked about this critter already. Uh, the biggest thing there is just making sure that we're picking frequently and not letting that fruit get too ripe as far as the spotted wing. Scale insects, you're gonna see that along the twigs. Um, Depends on the infestation as to what degree you're going to see that, but it's also going to affect the fruit. But you can see there the biggest control measure is going to be that dormant oil spray, right? And that's what we're going to be doing in January, February. It's going to smother that little critter out. That's why we want to spray that so it won't be an issue when we get here. 
if you don't make that application in January, February, then you're gonna see this. So always keep that in the back of your mind. When you go out to do your pruning, that's a good time to be applying that dormant oil too. But you gotta get thorough coverage when you do that, so keep that in mind. Uh, plum curculio, if you ever see something here that looks like a half moon, that's what that's gonna be, is this little critter here. Um, it's going to be really destructive to peach and, and plum early seasons, typically when we're going to see that. And that fruit is just going to start dropping off the tree. So, of course, this is at a little bit um, advanced stage. Oftentimes, it's going to look like this before we get here. But this is a late infestation. But you're also going to see this gumminess. So if you ever see this coming, you know, from a peach or a, a plum, then it's going to be this little critter here, the plum curculio. So you'll see there when we give you those spray control measures, um, spray at shuck split and your first cover spray with uh, carbaryl. Now remember what we talked about earlier, carbaryl is seven and we do that to thin fruit, right? So uh, we do that in thinning apples, but you can also have some fruit drop with the peaches and plums as well. The oriental fruit moss, um, is another critter and again you're going to see some of that gumminess. You're going to see some of these leaves dying back. It almost looks like it's been scorched. The bad thing about this of course is that they're tunneling right through the main core of that fruit. Same way with the coddling moth and you can see here it's 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 hard to really tell that with fruit that's hanging from the tree, right? And most of the injury is going to be produced in that second generation. That's just where that larva is feeding on the seeds of that developing apple. Uh, fruit thinning is going to help help with that. Uh, apply those insecticides that are coinciding with egg laying. So again, that's a topic for another night, but knowing those life cycles of the pest, properly identifying that pest is going to help you long term in any of these fruit crops. And then black knot, if any of you have ever seen this, um, pretty good name there, right? Pretty simple, black knot. But if you see any of these little things growing, almost looks like a, a gall. Uh, these come from wild and abandoned trees. It's going to affect any of our um, fruit trees. We've even seen this on some apples. But it's going to spread, notice there, during the spring, we have rainy, windy weather, which we always have in East Tennessee. So control is just removing that infected limb. This is not a good picture, but we would want to take we would want to prune that back pretty far because that inoculum is going to be as, you know, it can be all the way back here, the infection can be. So um, make the cut two to four inches. Sometimes I go further than that. It just depends on how progressed that gall is. But again, burn those um, prunings and making those uh, applications, fungicide applications when you need to is going to help prevent some of the occurrences of these things. So with that, that's a lot of information, right? Well, that's a lot of information, but <laughs> I would like to really say something. And I think for all of us, we, this is a really hard thing to do this way. Not having any feedback from people really and not feeling the vibrations and people there. So I think Melody really deserves a big thank you for doing this. And I don't think any of us really realize how tough this is to do. So thank you, Melody. Well, you thank you guys. Perfect job. And um, I think we really appreciate what you've done and what you put together for this. It was really interesting. It was very, very good. And I've heard this presentation a lot of times and it gets better every time. Well, thank you.